uh, post it online, uh, actually you will download a, a, a file contains pre-generated pre -generated Trento data. So uh, uh, the focus will, will still be on the Bayesian side, but not on how to generate uh, uh, a lot of events using the Trento initial condition model. So for this lecture, uh, I will first review the medium evolution in Jetscape and talk about the ingredients of the Trento uh, model for initial condition. And after that, I will talk about a few uh, interesting event properties that you can already start to study at uh, the initial condition level. And after the summary, uh, before we get into uh, the, the hands-on session, uh, there will be a, a warm-up, some, some uh, flashback of the Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian theory. So to, to this point, uh, uh, especially from talks uh, of last week, you have seen that the Jetscape is uh, contained for a, 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 a lot of modules to do both jet and medium event generation uh, in heavy-on collisions. <coughs> and from yesterday's talk, we, we see that uh, uh, we also want to integrate the statistical package uh, to calibrate uh, the model parameters of this uh, simulation framework. Uh, so on the left, which is labeled very right, is the focus of this uh, study is actually the soft models, uh, the, the soft medium evolution models. So here you have uh, all kinds of uh, dynamical model like pre equilibrium dynamics, hydrodynamics, and uh, partonic transport. But at the beginning of all this, you re really need, you, you need to initialize the system uh, from a certain time. And actually this initialization procedure contains a lot of uncertainties that should be propagated to your predictions and to your extraction of interested physical parameters such as shear and bulk viscosities. So to initialize the dynamical evolution, we start by considering two approaching nucleus, A and B. Uh, they are labeled by A and B throughout this literature. Uh, they are uh, when they're approaching at uh, almost the speed of light, they are Lorentz contracted, so you have this uh, pancake shape, uh, nuclei uh, approaching together, and they're, because they are so fast, those slow degrees of freedom uh, inside the nuclei, like the nucleonic degree of freedom, are very slow. So effectively, they are frozen at the moment you collide. Uh, therefore, uh, event by event, you're actually sampling almost frozen nuclear ge uh, geometry or nuclear configurations that's fluctuating event by event. At the collision point, uh, there are very complicated dynamics, many body dynamics going on, and uh, it's very hard to go from uh, first principle to, to predict what's produced in the, at the middle of rapidity. And the way we took it is to model uh, the energy production as function of transverse coordinates at the middle of rapidity at this very initial time using uh, a parametric model, which of course will introduce a certain uh, theoretical uncertainties. So after that, uh, uh, each stage uh, of the dynamics is governed by uh, well-motivated dynamical models, which will not be the focus of this lecture. So for the ingredients of Trento inch condition, again, we start by uh, preparing the nuclear configurations. So for heavy nuclei that we often interested in heavy ion collisions, uh, the one nucleon, uh, including proton neutrons distribution function, is well modeled or parameterized by this Wood Saxon uh, density, func uh, density distribution. So, you see this uh, angular and radial distribution uh, of the uh, nucleon looks a lot like this, uh, this uh, Fermi, Fermi function, where deep inside the nuclei you have a saturated density, and density decreases exponentially when you get to the boundary. Uh, and it takes, uh, uh, there, there, there's a wise parameter control how steep this uh, decreases is at the boundary because the diffusing, diffusiveness parameters. And also because not all the ground state of nuclei are, are round shaped, for example, for uranium, uh, they it has this strong uh, deformed prolate shape. So Trento also allows uh, the parameterization for this deformed nucleus. Uh, instead of uh, just sampling one particle, uh, sorry, one nucleon distributions, the Trento initial condition also uh, introduces the minimum nucleon nucleon distances, the D minimum parameter. So no two pair of nucleons are sampled uh, with, with distance closer than, than this distance to mimic certain short range repulsion. 
Of course, this procedure is only for heavy nuclei. For light nuclei, such as, such, such as helium, uh, you cannot uh, just use the wood saxon distribution, but in these cases, uh, you can uh, load configurations from, for example, nuclear structure calculations. So having prepared the nuclei, we uh, need to determine how they collide. So at this high energy, uh, the nuclear positions are, are frozen. So effectively, we have, all we have to treat is actually uh, pairwise nuclear nucleon collisions. So nucle uh, nucleons, proton neutrons are extended objects. And in trying to model this uh, extensiveness is treated by modeling the proton shape as a three-dimensional Gaussian. So here you have the proton shape as function of transverse, uh, transverse uh, radius r and uh, uh, the longitudinal uh, coordinate z. And since everything is contracted in z direction, we are not so interested in the details in that dimension. We integrate over the, the z, integrate over uh, the longitudinal direction to get uh, the proton thickness function, which is again a two-dimensional Gaussian. So uh, for the collision of such extended objects, we expect that uh, the more the two protons overlap, there should be a larger probability for them to collide. Therefore, you should have a certain probability to collide as a function of impact parameter. And such impact parameter dependencies should, uh, should be passing through to this collision probability by the, the magnitude of the overlap between their densities. So this overlap function is just uh, uh, the convoluted density of two colliding nucleons separated by a certain impact parameter. And this enters the collision probability uh, in this uh, econo-driven uh, form. So you have the collision probability, uh, sorry, uh, you have the overlapping function sits in the exponential and you have this effective uh, proton opacity parameter sigma gg controls uh, how much interaction you can have. So on the left, I illustrated you three uh, typical curves of this collision probability as function of uh, impact parameter between two protons. And here I var also vary the uh, effective opacity parameter. So you see that when the two proton hits high down, there's a very large probability for them to collide. Uh, but of course, this is a probability. So even if you increase the opacity parameter very large, it can never be larger than one. So at uh, larger distances, for example, uh, greater than two Fermi over C, there's a very little chance for two protons to have uh, inelastic collisions. So this sigma GG looks like a parameter, but it's actually can be determined from experiments using the inelastic cross-section at a given beam energy as input. Uh, so we require that when you integrate this collision probability uh, as function of uh, impact parameter, you get some uh, dimension of an area, and this area should match the experimentally measured proton-proton inelastic cross-section. So this sigma GG is not really an independent parameter. Uh, it can be fixed uh, by given this experimental measured proton-proton cross-section. So now we have known that how to do pairwise nucleon collisions, we apply such a criterion to each pair of the nucle uh, nucleons inside nuclei A and B. So suppose this pair of nucleons are labeled by I and J. Uh, of course, for, nucleons, uh, for, for nucleus, they are separated by this uh, nucleus nucleus impact parameter, B, A, B. But you can always compute uh, the pairwise nucleon impact parameter by doing some simple vector uh, addition subtractions. So again, you can compute for each part of the nucleon what's the probability for them to collide, and then you sample this probability to determine uh, which of these nucleons part actually participate in the inelastic scatterings. And there's a very useful term, it's called participants, uh, are those nucleons that suffers at least one inelastic collisions. Again, nucleons are uh, extended objects. So for each of these participants, they actually contribute a, a, a finite patch in the, transverse, uh, in the transverse area. So we smooth the contribution from each nucleus, each participant nucleus by their two-dimensional density functions to define the so-called participant densities. 
So the participant densities for each nuclei are labeled by TA or TB, which is simple summing all the contributions from your participants. Uh, here, we also, for each contribution, uh, it's also modulated by a unit mean gamma distribution, random variables. So its importance will be, uh, we will come back to its importance later, uh, but currently I can tell you that uh, we have to include such a contribution, uh, a, a fluctuation, to mimic the huge multiplicity fluctuation while you do proton-proton collisions. So now comes the most important part of this trend to initial condition. So we have, no, we have, we have decided how to uh, sample binary nuclear collisions. We have determined uh, which nucleons participate in the inelastic collisions. We want to use this information to determine the energy deposition at mid rapidity. Uh, uh, as I said, this should be really a dynamical process, but in Trento, we take this parametric approach. So the energy deposition as function of transverse location at mid rapidity is assumed to be purely a function of TA and TB. Basically, the thickness function, uh, sorry, the participant density uh, from the target and uh, a projectile nuclei up to some uh, normalization factor can tune to fit uh, multiplicity in the final, data, uh, final state particles. So this uh, Trento model takes up a particular parametric form of F. Uh, so here you can see in the second equation, this form is known as uh, the generalized mean. So given two participant density from each direction, uh, this function raises each of them to power of p, take the average, and then uh, take the, the power of 1 over p. This is just an ansatz, but it's known to reproduce very many very interesting limit. So on the left of the figure, uh, so, so the ball figure is just showing the two participant density projected into the transverse plane. Uh, the bottom figure uh, is actually you, you pick a fixed y coordinates and you scan through the value of t and tb as a function of the x coordinates so here the dashed line solid line are actually the two participant density from each of the nuclei now if you vary the p parameters from minus infinity to infinity the maximum range you get all kinds of a different way to deposit energy as function of t and tb so such a, uh, different ways of depositing energy will give you this gray band of uncertainties. So uh, you really, in this way, you really don't know how the energy are deposited exactly, uh, but you know that it's somewhere sandwiched between the limits of TA and TB. So on the right, uh, by choosing different values of P, you are actually reproducing very interesting uh, limits. Uh, so if you cho choose a very large P, it's actually returning the maximum value of the, the two participant density. If it's a very sm a small negative value, uh, it's returning the minimum. And in between from minus one to one, you recover different uh, uh, way of averaging over uh, the two contribution from each nucleus. So this P parameter is essentially another degrees of freedom in the model uh, that parameterize how to deposit energies and is yet to be constrained by data. But of course, usually we don't think P should really take minus infinity to infinity. In that sense, you are not using, uh, you're, you're only using one of the information of TA and TB. So a more realistic prior and also su suggest by earlier study is actually P from minus one to one, which is shown in this uh, blue range. So it's not, uh, that uncertain compared to the full range labeled by gray color, but still you see by varying p from minus one to one, you get some significant uncertainty in how uh, the geometry at mid rapidity looks like. Okay, I will ask uh, if there's any questions up to this point. Uh, yeah, um, do, we have, do we have any questions from the Slack channel? <laughs> 